If you came here for a slam poetry reading, unfortunately, you're going to be disappointed. We're going to talk about uh, development of single page web applications. Uh, my name is Michael Mikowski, and um, this is a sequel to uh, two prior presentations that I've given on the subject. Uh, what's ironic is the last uh, couple times uh, we had standing room only in the room, and my book hadn't been published yet. Now my book is published, and uh, we've got a few empty spaces. So uh, I guess you just got to roll with it. Um, uh, we've been selling well on Amazon, so I'm, I'm pretty pleased with that. So uh, without further ado, I put together a uh, deck here. I'm going to be pulling a little bit of a Pink Floyd here. Uh, Pink Floyd in um, The Wall, the famous song Comfortably Numb, did something that few rock bands ever did before, which is play two guitar solos in the same song. And uh, there's a lot of people who are rock uh, critics who thought that was absolutely amazing. Uh, I'm going to be actually giving two live demos uh, during the same presentation. So perhaps not the same thing as uh, David Gilmore, but in the same spirit. So with that being said, I'm going to get to my written notes, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk. All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is my favorite subject, myself. Um, so, as I mentioned, we have the book Single Page Web Applications, which actually was published, uh, the, the official published date was September 26th, which means it was about uh, two years of uh, no weekends for me, uh, developing that book along with my co-author, Josh Powell. Uh, I'm currently the Senior Director of uh, UX Engineering at Qualaroo, and we'll talk a little bit more about Qualaroo, but we basically do online surveys and conversion tools. Um, uh, I have developed six production single-page applications since 2006. Um, uh, I've been an architect on all but one of them. Um, so I've got uh, a, a good amount of don't bang your head against the wall kind of experience, right? Like if there's anything stupid you've ever done with a single-page application, I've probably done it too. Um, so basically the book that I wrote, and actually there's a review on Amazon that talks about it, that there's not an amazing amount of new uh, technology that's being presented there, but what it does is show you all the ways you can cut yourself and uh, what perhaps you should avoid when doing that. Um, so my first uh, single page application was in 2007 when I released it, and that was for the Where to Buy site for AMD. Um, and uh, that was a really cool uh, application and it was not intended to be a single page application because um, uh, but but uh, hosting requirements forced it to be okay so let's talk a little bit about SPAs uh, obviously these are real hot uh, these days have been for the last couple of years so I'm not going to talk too much about it just do some remedial stuff uh, a single page web application is an application that doesn't reload during a, a user session. And um, they've become really popular because people are now expecting native application-like performance. Um, I, I really like the LinkedIn application or many other applications that you get on Android or iOS these days where the application you get is actually the web application just wrapped up with a little bit of window dressing and taking advantage of perhaps some uh, phone gap features. Um, so, uh, but, but it, it's cool when you go to the browser and say, you know, the, the experience is almost exactly the same. Um, so um, again, users are, are really getting to experience or getting to expect that. And um, SBAs have been around for a long time. Um, you know, Flash has been around, Java Office Suites uh, from over a decade ago, of course, JavaScript mortgage calculators have been around for a while as well. What we're talking about here today are developing JavaScript native uh, single page applications, meaning that the language of the single page application is JavaScript and we're using native HTML5 rendering techniques as opposed to using a Flash plugin or using a Java uh, overlay or something like that. So I've got a couple pictures of a few of the SPAs that I've worked on. Um, and uh, uh, let's talk a little bit more about them because this is uh, relevant to the presentation I'm going to be 
covering today, the, the quality aspect of it. Um, first of all, one thing about uh, the SBA is that uh, a lot of the business logic moves from the server to the browser. Um, and that's a, a good rule when you're developing an SPA is to try to move as much logic as you can to the browser, uh, leaving things like authentication, uh, authorization, and uh, a, a permanent data storage for the uh, server. Um, because of this, you're really moving a lot of your application development to the front end. And so um, remember those hundreds of thousands of lines of code you used to write on the server? Well, they've now moved to the front end, and the number of developers that go went along with them also end up moving to the front end. So one SPA may require many developers, uh, as opposed to having just the web guy who's doing whatever he wants to do with, uh, with JavaScript. So um, the, the big takeaway here is that the conventions and discipline previously reserved for server-side development becomes a must for working at the scale that is required for a lot of single-page web applications. So, as I mentioned, this is a sequel to The Fog of SPA, which was my last one, which is a paraphrase on uh, Robert Strange McNamara's uh, The Fog of War. Um, uh, you don't have to have been present at the prior presentation to win. So uh, thanks for coming, if you, even if you weren't there. But uh, it helps. Um, the Fog of SPA was really talking about uh, the, kitchen, the kitchen sink syndrome I've seen with a lot of people when they do dive into web development. They're like, oh, we're going to get like a bootstrap, and we're going to get jQuery UI, and then we're going to get Backbone, and we're going to get Angular, and we're going to get about 15 other buzzwords and just pile it all in here into this project, and it's going to be successful. And um, of course, the reality is, is that that's actually overcomplicating the project and almost guaranteeing that it's going to be much, much more expensive and uh, much less successful. And so uh, my viewpoint was simplify, simplify, simplify. Um, if you do that, um, if you've removed the kitchen sink, um, you can, uh, it's just a, a virtuous cycle where um, uh, everything becomes easier. So choose your toolkits sparingly and wisely. As I mentioned before, I will not be doing too much slam poetry, uh, although perhaps later at the pub. Um, be grateful this is not a sequel to Monsters, Inc. You know, I'm sorry it was six months, but Monsters, Inc. was, what, about 11 years? Um, and we will be working with live code, so please stand back from the stage here. It, you know, it could be a, a bit dangerous. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before about Comfortably Numb, we are going to be doing two uh, demos. So uh, bear with me when I mumble sometimes uh, during that. Okay, so let's recall from the fog of war, um, or the fog of SPA. Uh, my point again was that SPA development can become so complex, it's beyond the ability of the human mind to comprehend all the variables. Our judgment and our understanding are not adequate, and we kill projects unnecessarily. Okay, that's when you throw the kitchen sink in there. Now, I'm going to bring up the seven lessons that were from there, and I'm not going to read them all off. Um, they're all pretty common sense when you read them, right? I do want to point out that we want to look at this issue today, the architect for workflow and testing, and we also want to look at the testing itself, okay? So that's how we're going to uh, build the continuum, the bridge to the previous uh, presentation. And as I mentioned before, this all comes back to the fact that conventions and disciplines previously reserved for the back end now start making a lot of sense for the client. So we're going to show some uh, code. Um, I was going to just take the testing uh, chapter from my book and uh, you know uh, walk through the slides and kind of talk you through the chapter, but. I thought, what the heck, let's show you some of the newest stuff that I'm currently doing at Qualibrew, which actually goes beyond the book. So before we uh, dive into that, let me tell you what we're doing to give you a little bit of a frame of reference. So Qualibrew, as I mentioned, does online surveys um, and conversion products. 
And so you've probably all seen something like this that pops up in, like, like say, bottom uh, right-hand corner of your browser when you're busy. And this is called an unobtrusive survey, um, or hopefully not too intrusive survey. Um, the interesting angle here is that uh, previously I was always integrating lots of third-party packages into one complete solution. In this case, for the first time, I am the third-party JS. <laughs> Uh, so it's kind of interesting working from the other side of the aisle, so to speak. Um, and the requirements for third-party JavaScript are pretty interesting, um, at least for this product, what, what we set up. Um, we don't use jQuery because that's too heavy, and we don't want to have uh, library conflicts. Um, we don't use any external files. We don't use any external images. We don't use any external CSS. It's all in one file. Even the data is delivered in one file as well. Um, so it's been kind of fun. And uh, my involvement actually was bringing the product to mobile, uh, which is now uh, going to become the, um, the foundation for the next generation desktop client as well. It was a, a great way to, to expand the product line was to go into mobile, um, do everything quote unquote right, you, including using proper testing, which I will illustrate today. Um, and then based on that, now we have a great testing framework um, that runs in a half second. And we can move that to the desktop and take advantage of that there um, as well. So we're going to come up to our first demo. And um, these notes here I mention for myself more than you, but you're welcome to re read along. Um, I used to work for a company called Structural Dynamic Research Corporation back in the 90s. Um, and at that time, uh, SDRC, as it was called, was one of the largest engineering and uh, uh, design uh, software packages available and also one of the most popular. Um, and one thing that always struck me about it was that everything that you could do on the screen, you could do with command line. They actually had a little command prompt. And, um, it's really amazing because you could like take a three-dimensional model on your HP uh, series workstation and spin it around and click on the surface and it would light up and you could draw on that and you could fill it things and it was a very interactive three-dimensional experience. Yet somehow they were able to echo everything you were doing graphically on a command line. As you were working on your model, the command line would just print the commands out. And you could capture that command line and then uh, replay it or edit it, which was really, really very powerful. And I was really rather successful with the language because I was a developer um, uh, from years past. And um, it gave me a real leg up on, uh, on that. And I became uh, a consultant for SDRC. Um, so I think that's a really good test of do you have a good model, right? One of my favorite things I, I, I talk about when I speak to folks who uh, especially use Ruby on rail, Rails is I like to say active record is not your model, right? Active record maybe is a component of your model, but you shouldn't think of active record as your model because if you are, then you're leaving too much stuff out. A real good test of your model is can I, can I run the thing on the command line? All right, so um, these notes here are just for me. I'm gonna, these are the steps I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull open a model on an emulator I have for our mobile product. And I'm going to uh, post a couple responses and uh, you'll get the general idea here in a second. Well, basically we're gonna interact with a survey um, by, um, by, by just accessing the model, okay? So here's the emulator, okay? Let me do one thing here first. I'm gonna, um, I have a little node, uh, yeah, there we go, a little node cluster ready to go. So I'll just uh, start up my cluster, okay? So I've got uh, one less than my number of cores serving, which is probably a little bit overkill here. Uh, <laughs> But uh, so seven cores running on, uh, on Node right now. Um, and then we're going to go back to um, the emulator here. And what that uh, Node's going to do is, is capture some of the responses here. Now I'm going to reload this. 
And what you're going to see is the uh, actual nudge, um, as they call it, or, or online survey. And I can start clicking through this as if I was touching it with my finger, right? So I can look at the question type and say the net promoter score and, uh, you know, change uh, things. Okay, so that's like, that's like when I was working at SDRC on a 3D solid model. I am, I am navigating graphically through this uh, nudge. Now let's do something over here with the command line. Uh, let's go uh, model is equal to uh, ki nudge model. This is my guitar solo, folks. Okay, so the first thing I like to do is I'm going to stop this nudge. So I'll just do model, stop, nudge. I really do like how uh, I get autocomplete. There, I've stopped the nudge. Now, um, I'd like to now get it to actually select a nudge again. So I'll just say select nudge. Returns to true, there's a timeout. Wow, there's a nudge. Now what I want to do here is I want to um, respond to this. So I'm going to do a post response. And there we go. Okay. Let's try that again. Let's select the nudge again. Oops. All right. We'll post something here. Okay. Um, now, um, don't, don't mind these uh, little layers that are popping up here. That's from my server. But um, now I can do, well, let's say, which one of these do we want to take? Well, let's see. The button, let's, let's take selection number two, question types, right? All right. So I'll say, um, we'll post a response. Because I happen to know the API here, I know that I can give it the ordinal number on the list here. So the ordinal number is not zero. That would give me flexible targeting. Question type should be one, so I'll press one. And there I've taken my response. Okay. Now uh, here, let's go to uh, let's go to the net promoter score. So we'll go zero. Okay. I should be able to now post response here. Uh, just an empty response here will accept the next. Cool. All right. Now I'm going to uh, post a response here. Now this isn't going to change this graphically, but I'm going to tell it that um, I'm going to give it a, a NPS score, which is from 0 to 10. I'm going to give it a uh, low score, OK? What the heck? Let's give it a, a score of 2. Let's see what happens. Oh, you see that? It says it, it's responding, saying, OK, what can we do to improve? All right, just to speed things up here, I'll, well, I guess to prove my point, we'll just continue responding like this. I'll hit respond. Uh, we'll uh, pick that. Um, uh, we'll pick that same um, selection again. Again, respond, but this time we'll respond with a high value. We'll give it a high value of nine. Okay, and look what happens. Now I get the response for the the higher value. Um, so I think you get my point here. The point is, is that um, we've built a state model that is robust enough where we are able to run it from the command line. And that's a real good kind of rule of thumb. Are you able to run your, your, your model, your, your, your application using command line or not? If you can't, then maybe your model isn't as robust as you'd like it to be. Because if you can run it from the command line, that means that you can run it from automated tests. And that's the important part. There was my first guitar solo, so to speak. <coughs> Sorry about this, I'm just getting my... Uh... Oh, by the way, this is the responses that are rolling in from the Node.js server. Okay, um, so let's see if I can get this to uh, show up again.
It's like she's stuck, Captain. Oh, there we go. All right, I'll roll with that. All right. You recall, if you happen to have read the book or uh, seen uh, any of my previous presentations, that the general architecture we like to do is a, a variation on the classic model view controller. Um, and of course, MVC is everywhere. Um, we like to point out that uh, architecture is actually fractal. Uh, the MVC patterns show up uh, on numerous layers of your application. Um, but what we're going to focus on today uh, are the model, the data, and the base utilities. Um, and uh, uh, the key to this is fake data, um, so or stub data, as some people call it. Um, the point is, is that if you don't have known data, you can't really test your model, right? If your data is uh, like, if my, if I didn't have a known survey to test against, there, I wouldn't be able to write tests. Right, so you have to have a known test uh, coming in. When you actually take out all those different elements that aren't uh, being used in the architecture there, you end up with basically what you just saw me do, which is I have the fake JavaScript, or the fake uh, data, which is in fake, and then I have the model, which we've made robust um, uh, by always bringing state issues and data back into it, and then we have the JavaScript console, which I was interfacing with. Now, you should think about when you're testing a single page application, there are really like six different test modes. Uh, you can probably think of a few additional ones. but um, And I'm going to just, just quickly just spout them off. The, the sim and these go from the simplest to the most complex. So the simplest one is where you have fake data, model, and your JavaScript console. Like you're first developing something, and you just want to make sure that it's working in the browser. This is probably the best way to do it. Stub out your data, have your model working, open up your JavaScript console, and ask something of your model, and does it work? Okay. Once you get that working, then it's easy to move to a test suite. And once you get that working, then you can pull open your browser and see if it's being rendered properly. The key that you'd like to do is you'd like to keep the things that, that, that do the I.O. to be as thin of layers as possible so you can, you can encapsulate as much into the model as possible and test as much as possible because we all know that any sort of testing that involves the user interface gets very, very expensive very quickly. Uh, and the payback just isn't there usually. Um, and then things get more complicated when we start throwing in live data. The point that I want to bring out is that when you're trying to resolve a problem, the best place to resolve a problem is down there at the bottom of the stack, where things are really nice and easy, right? And, and they're the least complex. The worst place to solve problems is at that last bit there. Number six is what we also call production or integration testing, right? And there's so many variables involved there that hopefully you're going to be able to isolate your problem someplace earlier up on the chain. So I have over here the diagrams that uh, will look familiar again if you have the book. And again, I'm not going to go into a great detail uh, about them, but uh, you can see, for example, here where we have the test data and all these grayed out boxes are things that have been disabled. And as you see, as we go further and further along, the number of grayed out boxes decreases further and further. So finally, this is uh, effectively integration testing, where you basically you've, you've turned off all your test instrumentation and you've turned on all your production boxes, if you will. So what's my point? Mode six is like the moon. It's an interesting place to visit, but you really don't want to live there. And you really don't want to try to fix your bugs there. If you find yourself fixing bugs, bugs in integration testing all the time, you might think of yourself as kind of comparable to somebody who is using Notepad for uh, text editing as a developer, right? You're wasting somebody's time. Right? 
if you're a developer, right, and you're going to be doing uh, text editing basically for a living, and you're using Notepad, you're just not the best you could be. And uh, I think that the same thing can be applied for testing. So um, what we did at Qualaroo that I think is pretty cool is we used the concept of handlers. Now, this is not a new concept, and if you thought about it before me, great. Um, more power to you. I'm just up here sharing you with you what I thought was uh, something that worked out really well. Um, I used to actually manage uh, hundreds of uh, Linux boxes uh, running Apache clusters. And um, uh, we ran ModPerl, where we uh, basically uh, programmed the, the Apache uh, web ser uh, server. We would swap out the uh, log handler with our own, for example, or remove handlers altogether or add new ones. Um, and the handlers um, usually do things with input-output um, with real-world entities. Like uh, in the case of um, our application, we'll present information to users or we'll write cookies to the browser or we'll send data back to the browser. You know? but. So if you can think about what I just showed you, where we have a stateful model, that's a self-contained stateful model that handles data, and then it just has these thin layers that go out and interact with the rest of the world, kind of like sensors, if you will, that you attach to the model. And the cool thing is that, like Apache, we built a, a handler stack where you can stack handlers. So imagine this. you can take something that works perfectly fine in production, leave it untouched, and just stack on a couple of handlers to, say, report back to the mothership about how your application is doing. Okay, so let's say you have one handler that handles pre presenting uh, to the user a, uh, a view of um, your survey, right? But you also want to report that back for debugging purposes. Um, you can do that. In fact, um, what we did, uh, this is back when I was doing the, the uh, clusters, we called that remora code. It was kind of like you let the big fish keep swimming the way it was, but you attach a little piece of software to it so you can tell what's going on. So at, uh, at Qualaroo, we went from an architecture similar to this, where we had uh, a big ass object Sorry about all these technical terms here, folks. But uh, with, with all these different sort of functions in them and all kind of mishmashed together, and you know, it's a typical kind of spaghetti code issue where you have to kind of like extract things. And by the way, the people who wrote the code were good. The problem was that we just had too many people and too many deadlines that were involved with the code. And that's how this vicious cycle, not, not virtuous cycle, uh, evolves into code like this. What we have actually in the uh, in the the mobile code now looks more like this, and uh, I think the really neat thing here is this handler queue here. Again, you see here that we have like these control layers that um, attach to the outside world, so to speak, and then you have the model, and then you have model events, and those feed into this handler queue which then will uh, call various things. And it's, uh, it's pretty neat. Like if the display is not ready to run yet, things just queue up. Um, and uh, I'm pretty pleased with that. And what we'll do is uh, in the next uh, guitar solo, so to speak, we're going to um, uh, take a look at that handler in action. So um, the book talks about using node unit. Um, and I've used it now for a couple of projects, and I like it. It's simple, and it certainly does the work that I need it to do, right? Now, you could go out and use Zombie.js. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Zombie, but the idea of Zombie is, is instead of testing mode one that we talked about, Zombie tests mode six. Zombie test is like for full integration testing. And I'm not saying there's not a place for it, but if you don't have to go through that kind of expense of installing an app, uh, uh, a framework that includes a full web quit, WebKit rendering engine, um, then, then wouldn't it be great to avoid that, right? Um, 
You know, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are doing full integration testing to find fundamental logic errors. And that's way too expensive, right? You could do it much less expensively by using something like NodeUnit, Node.js, and a solid model. Not, not a solid model, you know, you know what I mean. Okay, so if you want to install Node.js, uh, or sorry, NodeUnit um, on your local box, it's, it's as simple as typing this in. Um, and uh, the node unit file, uh, for those unaware, is simply a uh, JavaScript file. It's a valid JavaScript file. You can run it using node. Um, it just won't do anything. It'll just kind of stare at you. Um, at the end, when you do the exports, that defines the test that you're going to do and what order they're going to proceed. Uh, one nice thing about node unit or one bad thing, depending upon who you ask, is that it's synchronous te testing, right? <coughs> so each test is run in order and receives a test object. And this is how you start your tests. So you'll write a function, uh, as you saw in that earlier manifest. You take the object and you say, I expect X number of tests. Excuse me. Our next step is to enter in our assertions. So if you say you're going to assert five times, then you write five asserts. And they look something like this. Test object, OK. If it's a true statement, then you can say uh, truth prevails. Um, and then at the end, the test is concluded by sending a done signal through the test object. Now, that's the actual magic. Until that done object gets that, or until the test object gets the done signal, uh, it's not going to move on to the next test. So it allows you to check for prerequisites before you proceed to the next test. Uh, a great example of this is, for example, if you have a login process, right? The login process has some timers involved with it, um, and you don't want to... Uh, uh, or you can't move forward, you can't test um, uh, the login parameters until after the user is actually logged in. Um, well, the way to do that is, or the way to handle that is to uh, put this in a, uh, the test object in a closure, and then only when the login project, uh, or, I'm sorry, login process is complete, do you fire off the test object is done. So this is my uh, second guitar solo. Um, and uh, we're going to build a test, OK? And so what I'm going to do is actually show you the node unit test that we run today before we ship to production. And this test suite started out with, I think, five tests. And we've just continually added to it as we've built the mobile product and also as we've uh, moved more and more logic into the model. So. Um, uh, again, these notes are for me. Um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually um, take um, an interaction that we're going to we're going to record using the emulator, and uh, we're going to then capture that into our unit test so we can help avoid a regression. Okay. So first thing we'll do is take a look at what we want to emulate. At this point, I can uh, turn off the JavaScript there. What I want to emulate is this behavior. We have this net promoter score survey question. Now, I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of net promoter score. I hadn't heard of it before, but it's a, it's a very scientific method. And one of the things that you don't want to do from a marketing standpoint is introduce bias. And what that means is that when you're choosing a number from 0 through 10, you can't have anything pre-selected. So you see there's no, no number up here. There's just this kind of cryptic icon that says maybe you should move this slider left or right. Okay? One of the things that people will do is click Next. They'll choose nothing. And as Rush did, in, uh, uh, as, they, as they said many years ago, 
If you choose not to make a choice, you st I'm sorry, <laughs> if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. In this case, the decision is to give no response. But um, so um, now I can actually emulate that uh, by opening up this again. And I'm going to tab over to my Node.js again, fire that up. Okay. Okay, so what I've done here is I've, I've moved to this, um, um, this node, as they call it, and I can say, uh, I can do a post response here. My response um, for NPS that is nothing is actually the number 11, okay? Uh, if anybody here has ever seen Spinal Tap, it gave us to 11, all right? So when I press return, I get, I come back to the default questions type page in the survey, which is the desired behavior, okay? Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to emulate that in the test. And uh, by showing you this, I'm gonna show you how it's instrumentated. Okay, so you can see here the response that we see via uh, the uh, Node.js. And I'm now gonna move us in to the actual test. Uh, thanks to the Qualaroo Engineering Group, by the way, for letting us uh, look at the, this live code. Um, okay, so I've prepared three files for you. The Node Unit Suite, then the Borked version, and the fixed version. So let's first uh, take a look at what, what it takes to test our uh, application uh, and provide a great deal of certainty before we uh, press a release. And all we have to do is type in node unit and then pick node unit suite.js and press return. And there we are, 549 milliseconds later, um, node unit returns. Okay. Now, actually, the text took only 400, I'm uh, sorry, 549 seconds but um, it took a little while longer to return um, on the command line. And the reason why is because of how JavaScript decides whether it's finished or not. Um, it's finished when A, it doesn't have any timers running, and B, there's nothing in the event queue. Um, I guess the, uh, the first one kind of implies the second, right? So until the last timer that's uh, associated with the model here is done, um, the uh, um, it, the application or node unit stays, stays kind of hung. At this point, I'm not worried about hunting down what that timer is because I can wait a half second. Let's take a look at how this is set up. So um, look at node unit JS, and at the end here we have uh, this module exports, and then we have uh, about a thousand lines of code, right? So all this does is it cycles through each one of these tests, and then each test consists of multiple asserts. Let's uh, add that additional one that we talked about before. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy nodeunit.js.bort over to nodeunit.js main. And um, the reason I'm gonna do this is because I learned a while ago that uh, trying to give a live demo without any crutches is, is really a fool's errand, or at least for me anyway. Um, so uh, let me just show what I've put together here. Um, I've added a, an additional test down here at the bottom, test NPS, okay? And what I've done is I've isolated the logic associated with that test. <coughs> Let's run through the logic. As we talked about before with node unit, you get a test object on uh, invocation of the function. 
Okay, so our last test will be test NPS, and then that function will receive a test object. Now up top here, I'm just simply declaring all my variables, pretty standard uh, practice. And now I'm gonna test three things, okay? These are some data structures which we're gonna come back to in a little bit. We're also gonna come back to these callbacks in a little bit. All right, here's the test we want. The first test is we're gonna show the NPS page in the first place, right? So if you remember from the emulator, I showed that page with the slider on it, okay? There is a command line that says show nudge, uh, or sorry, show node, and that will um, show that specific page. Let's take a look. So model show node and I believe that was underscore four. I'm feeling lucky. There you go. All right. So I can provide that command in this script. And if you look at the script, there is indeed a show node four right here. Now, this is where those callbacks start becoming important. There's no test being run here. There's no test being run here at all, yet for some reason, or, or for some reason, for some strange reason, I expect this to actually work. The, way, the place where the tests are actually run are in the callbacks, okay? Remember, we have handlers. So what I've done is, is we've registered a handler called show node to, um, uh, in, this, in this model, and, or sorry, it's called on show. So you'll see here, on show actually runs the test where it does a deep equal. And it also says, if there's a do end flag that is set to true, then I should trigger the test object done. So remember when I said that you're able to use the test object done in callbacks to uh, manage your synchronous execution of tests. So the first thing that we do is we um, show the node and we set this thing called a show key. The reason why is I'm using this map, as you see up here, and I'm saying, I should see data come back that looks like this question for NPS data. And then the same thing applies here with a response. Once you show this node, as illustrated here, and somebody, say, picks a response and clicks next, that actually does two things. It sends a response back to the server that you see here in this get response, and it also shows the next node. And you wanna make sure it shows the right next node. Okay, so we're actually adding three tests by doing this. Now, with what I've set up, you'll see that the data structures I've set up to test against are all just empty objects. So now when I run node unit on the Borked version, you'll see a couple errors come across. There's actually three of 164 assertions are uh, problematic. But what you'll see is that I purposely put in empty, um, empty objects, right? So the comparison of my, um, uh, my expected uh, view for the NPS page was an empty object, but this is what I actually got. Now I've already tested this with the console, with my emulator, and I know it's good, right? I got the response I wanted to. So for posterity, and as a regression test, what I'd like to do is just copy this data structure. Let's go into the Bork version of this. Uh, 
So in my show data map, I'm just going to put this in as my object instead of the empty object. Matches up. Okay, now let's run it again. And you'll see now I only have two failures instead of three. Okay. So this is kind of uh, the uh, cart leading the horse in a way, but it works. In other words, I've tested it graphically. I know that it works. So um, what I'm doing now is running it uh, via script and copying the data structures and putting them into my script. This here is showing um, Here we go. This is the data uh, structure that is being returned for a response. So when you respond uh, by clicking on next, this is the response that we get back. And it actually makes perfect sense. I won't go into the details here, but uh, what's being sent back to the server here is correct. So I just copy this. And then in my response, my expected response data structure here. I'll paste it. Looks good. Do a quick JS lint on that to make sure that it's uh, looking good. Okay, so we'll just run node unit again. And now we're down to one assert, one, uh, assert that's bad. Okay, um, I won't bore you with doing the same thing again. I'll just simply copy uh, the uh, fixed version here uh, over to the node unit suite. Uh, I just do the same thing again um, where I copy over the uh, data structure that represents the, um, the response page. And so now when I run node unit against uh, my suite, um, I now have a 164 assertions and uh, uh, that are all useful in helping me determine uh, whether or not I have a regression uh, in my behavior. So that's it for my second guitar solo. Um, I'd like to talk about a few related tools. We're just about ready to wrap up here. Um, one thing that's a really good idea is that if you don't have good code standards, um, you know, uh, uh, it, it's difficult to get a team to work uh, well together. So I highly recommend uh, uh, good code standards. I have uh, a great uh, example of code standards, I believe, in the single page web application. Um, otherwise, you get a Tower of Babel. Um, also, I highly recommend using a code review tool um, and uh, applying the rule that uh, without a review that uh, we're not going to merge code into a master. Um, uh, it's always good to have fresh eyes to look over code. Uh, the peer review helps uh, encourage developer quality. Uh, knowing that Bob is going to be looking at my code makes me want to make sure that it doesn't look too stupid. Um, and it's great because all developers become familiar with the code and uh, learn from each other. And it's all, uh, it, I should mention it's always best to start fresh. If you're starting a, a brand new project, I highly recommend that you bring in code review then because that way you can kind of all grow up together with the same code. Uh, another thing that uh, I do on my team is uh, require a uh, JavaScript uh, hook uh, to ensure that JS Lint uh, is invoked. And uh, um, I'm, I'm hoping to garner favor uh, with Mr. Crockford so that I can get uh, comments back into JSON 
Um, but uh, <laughs> I do, uh, do highly recommend JS Lint. And again, I talk about settings uh, in the book, and I'd be happy to share with anybody the settings I recommend on that. So a few parting thoughts. Put as much into the model as possible. You want to embody as much logic and state as you can in that model so you can test it very, very easily, so you can script test it. I also recommend that you constantly refactor your code to bring in state or stateful um, elements, right? You know, there's always like this stateful creep. You got like this uh, application where this model is working perfectly, then you add some new capabilities and it's not in the model, it's in a, you know, it's some, in some view someplace. Take the time to bring it back to the model. It'll pay off in the end. Always good to reduce your problem to the simplest test mode. Again, don't try to solve all your problems in integration land. I've already talked about how that's like using Notepad. Um, and uh, I recommend trying the uh, stack handler uh, technique, the ability to take um, a model event and a stack handler so that you can uh, run Remora code uh, is very, very handy. Um, thanks for coming today. Thanks for sticking it out. Um, I do have a uh, code available for you if you want to get half off the book. Um, and that's at the uh, site that's listed there. And I'm open to any questions. Thanks for coming. Sure. Um, I have a question regarding integration tests. Mm -hmm. So you still say they're useful, you have to do them. Yes. Um, should we automate them? Or should we just use manual integration testing? What are your thoughts about this? I, I, I think that uh, um, my thoughts about that are it depends. OK. I think <laughs> that automated tests for the model are a giving. Yeah. You know, that, uh, if, you, if you do it right, you can actually write uh, code to write tests for you. Right? You just give it an API, it'll permeate mm -hmm. the API for you and write all these regression tests. But um, integration tests, I've tended to go towards uh, manually doing that. Um, okay. uh, not because I don't see that there's value with them, it's just because uh, there's two reasons. Number one, um, it's expensive to automate them, like I mentioned with Zombie. And then the other reason is uh, actually kind of cultural. Um, you end up doing things like this. Oh gosh, I'd really like to change this, but it took us a week to write this test in Zombie JS, and I don't want to do that again. So um, if that starts drive, if that sort of consideration drives um, uh, your development, maybe that's kind of doing things the wrong way. So okay. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Hey, Michael, you talked about the kitchen sink problem mm -hmm. and minimizing yep. as many factors as you can yep. to do whatever. But um, lots of teams are using front-end frameworks like Backbone or Ember or mm -hmm. Angular for their single page apps. Yep. What do you think of those front-end frameworks <laughs> for single page apps? Um, I don't use them. Um, that doesn't mean that they're not a good choice for various people. Um, but uh, I guess all the advantages they would have brought me uh, as an SPA developer, um, the opportunity to improve my life had passed by the time they'd been released. I'd already done a number of SPAs by that time, and I already had my own libraries and a certain level of understanding about JavaScript. So for me, it's actually simpler to just avoid the complexity of the libraries. Um, and um, I also find that, like, uh, especially my, my favorite one to pick on is Backbone and Underscore, right? jQuery provides about 80 to 90 percent of what Underscore and Backbone provide. The only difference um, in the overlap is that generally jQuery is more correct. Like, for example, you have an extend object capability in Backbone, you have an extend uh, object capability in underscore, um, and 
jQuery tends to be, in, in my experience, more correct more often. Um, so um, I like to go, you know, I like to kind of run naked, if you will, uh, without those. But uh, um, I've heard good things about Angular, et cetera. But uh, um, yeah, I, I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't use them. Okay, it just sounds like more like more of a personal pre preference because you're just really experienced in JavaScript. Uh, yeah, I think that. But the other thing is that again, like if you throw away the requirement, say for uh, like I, I've worked on a project with Backbone, and I ended up removing it because and uh, it removed uh, two layers of abstraction because we had Backbone added. Then we had to write exceptions to Backbone. So um, at that point. Um, that's two additional layers of, of abstraction. And we had hundreds and hundreds of additional lines of code that all got removed because we got rid of the kitchen sink, if you will. We got rid of that complexity. You got to really think about, okay, what's this doing for me and what is it saving me? And um, versus what, it, what is it costing me? And that's the thing that I, I think a lot of times people don't think about with a toolkit. Every toolkit's a huge cost. You got to like know their nomenclature, uh, know their uh, standards, et cetera. Those are all coming along for the ride. And if you choose 15 toolkits for your SPA, um, you know, that's 15 different languages and modes of thought you got to pick up that um, if you pick just one that's really good, like jQuery, then I think you're doing yourself a big favor over the two. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we have next uh, design. Um, yes? I didn't see you mention the uh, front browser testing. I was wondering when the front browser testing is doing, doing the integration testing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so the question was, what do I do for uh, cross-browser testing? And I, I have to get out of here because I think we have a next speaker. But um, uh, crossbrowsertesting.com um, with the matrix, bottom line is uh, what we currently use. Uh, we doing it, we're doing it manually with a matrix. But because we move uh, as much as possible in the model, um, th all we're testing is that very thin last you know, inch of the mile, if you will. Because um, uh, in the model, we do all that testing to make sure that we're receiving all the right data. So we're, uh, but that's what we do. And we have our, um, our targets that uh, we're shooting for, you know, i.e. eight and above, for example. No, we don't currently automate that. Oh. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody.